Welcome to the Scrivener, everyone. My name is Trevor Stamper. Um, I'm going to be your host for this evening, and uh, we're going to take this entire episode and do a deep dive into uh, uh, the work of James Posenel. James is uh, is here, and we're going to talk about everything that he's done. James, want to introduce yourself? <laughs> everything I've done ever, ever. I hi, I'm James Posnell. I've uh, I've been around a little while in the DCC space. Um, See, I, I I write and publish under Horseshark Games. Um, I uh, before that I was I was writing for a, a few other people, you know, here and there. So um, Shinobi Twenty Seven Games, uh, Angels, Demons, and Beings Between Volume Two, um, and that's kind of where I started. And then um, and, and so I, you know, I, I've written some things. It's been about what is it like five years? Five years, I think, writing in the DCC space exclusively yeah and, and so have you ever done any work let's just get this out of the way have you ever done any work uh for role-playing games tabletop role-playing games outside of dcc or was this where you got your first taste of it this is where i started i i, I was um i think i've always kind of fantasized you know back in the 80s about writing you know uh rpg uh, adventures content whatever um it felt like it's an impossibility, right? Like the, the 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 times being what they were, you know, you just, I couldn't even imagine going over to the, like the state of Wisconsin, right? To go to Gen Con uh, from Michigan, um, not all that far away, but as like a kid in the eighties, you're just like, that's fr way too far away. I will never do any of these things. But DCC was like um, the, the really lit a fire, like in, in my soul about, about writing. I was like, this system is so great. Uh, how can you not be excited about it? Because I was kind of looking. I was playing 3.5 and uh, was really tired of it. Um, so complex, right? Lots of things to know and rules. And, you know, it's just a, it's a build off between the GM and 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 the uh, the players. And so really tired of that. And just this really wide open system, DCC, I was like, it just kind of lit a fire and I started writing immediately. That's awesome. Had you been doing any writing for yourself or your own local gaming group and everything before then, or was it nope. really got your start here? Yeah, not a thing. And okay. actually, it was because I was gaming, right? Yeah. I was playing the game, and I was like, I think it was my kids, really. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they were like, you know, ten, eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there, and they they wanted to play um, elves. And they wanted to have a patrons, like one that was kind of a witch and then one that was more like a fighter type. And, you know, Daniel Bishop, uh, of course, you know, is huge, you know, cast a huge shadow in the community. Um, and reading his blog about how patrons work, uh, that they are there really to add flavor and and to metamorphosize the the player the, the character into something you know not generic anymore like once you're bonded with that patron you're you're on a road uh with them somewhere and so they can affect you not just through um the spells they grant you right but also like the 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 changes that come over you the patron taint that that arises as you make mistakes casting spells and so here i am the kids want to do these things those don't exist those particular patrons didn't really exist exactly. And so I'm off to the races writing. And then yeah. you got three or four of those. And then you're like, you know, checking out angels, demons, and beings between. I'm like, I don't even know David Fisher and he lives in Australia. And I'm like, Hey, you don't know me. I want to write a book and I want you to publish it. <laughs> yep. Let me write volume two. You don't even know me. It's the internet. It's the internet. Crazy. It's all going to work out. Yeah, it's all going to be great. So, so from that work with uh, with like Shinobi Twenty Seven and everything, um, from there you you start working on your own, right? But you were also working. You did a couple of things with Don Stroud and everything. Yeah. So yeah. before we get it, before we launch into your own stuff, it, it's 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 really interesting because uh, to talk, uh, I'd like you to talk about that relationship you have with Don. And what it's like to have a partner in writing. This is something that we've not really covered on the Scrivener. It was like, as a third-party publisher, um, when you're still learning the ropes and everything, or even when you've mastered them and you've gotten a book out, sometimes it's really helpful to have 
somebody to, you know, juggle ideas off of and work with um, that you work well with, obviously. Yeah. Um, can you describe that relationship and can you describe, you know, what it's like, what was, what it has been like for you to work as a team and what, how did that break down? Yeah. So I'd met Don, a, a, I don't know, like 10 years previous at, at, a, at work um, and uh, didn't know he gamed at the time, didn't know anything, but I had a friend also who I, who was at work as well. And then over time, it just all came out that we were um, RPG players. And, um, and so we started gaming together. Like that's our local group. Don's, you know, one of the guys that runs stuff. I run stuff. Um, and so we just kind of take turns testing out our, our alpha material <laughs> on the group. Sure. And, uh, and so, uh, and getting to work with him, you know, he's writing stuff. He was writing Mothership, right? And and he was, uh, and, and I was kind of like piddling around with some things, actually House of the Red Doors at the time. And uh, I, even when I was with David Fisher, David, very early on, I was like, you know, you can do this by yourself. You know, it's not all that difficult to get going and, and do self-publishing. And I was just like, I don't know anything about this. Uh, I'm writing. I don't think I can put that, you know, take that on too during, during this project. And so, but, you know, to kind of go back is like, he, I was trying to get him to, to publish House of the Red Doors and, and he was working on a, a, a manuscript, kind of a you know, Google doc of, for um, what became um, the, the Legion, uh, the Celestial Legion. And, and so uh, uh, kind of at the same time, we're trying to get our, our houses in order around making the jump to being self-publishing. And so we were just uh, encouraging each other, like, you know, I was like, hey, you should publish this. And he was like, no, just do it by yourself. And, and so he kind of, he um, and I was asking for way too much in royalties, <laughs> I think is part of it too. I was like, yeah, it's 50%. It's already written. It's all done. It's like, all the maps are here. All the art's here. You don't have to do anything. You just put your your mark on the back of it and and pay that's for it. it yeah right he's like that's too much i was like well okay maybe i'm wrong but he also was working for mothership and mothership's royalties were were different and smaller uh, yeah you know a lot smaller and, um, and that's an interesting thing to note is that you know different companies have different ways that they build relationships with with writers with artists with editors um you know as a third-party publisher you've got to kind of find your own way through that and it's not like there's a manual that we can find that says here's exactly how you do this this is what your royalty should look like yeah. if you even pay royalties right yeah um, and most people can't most that's people not, can't yeah that's it basically royalty is like upfront payment on the number of copies that you expect to sell yeah right um and you gotta have pockets to do that and, yeah and i mean that makes sense for kanoff right? Or Harper Collins or something, right? People who expect to sell tens of thousands of a product, they have millions of dollars, they have, you know, they, they, they basically have portfolios that are bringing in money, right? As you know, as third party publishers, right? I mean, uh, you know, when I run a Kickstarter for something like Tales of the Smoking Worm, even if it makes what seems like an extraordinary amount of money past what I'm asking for, it's paying for that product and it's paying yeah. for everything that I need to do to get that done. It's paying for writers and it's paying for artists and it's paying for editors. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, James, I, I actually use a, a pretty advanced editing team now. Um, and, and so I've got three or four levels of editing that it goes through and all of those people get paid and they get paid before I recoup any money. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So what, what looks like a great kick, Kickstarter, um, actually gets spent pretty quick yeah uh, so yeah keep going. you're almost hoping at the end of it that you have like maybe a, a 500 a thousand bucks lying around that you can start using on the next project like to yes to just start getting some art in and and you know little spot pieces that you know you need or maps or whatever it is right right and so and so one of the things that we do so as I've hired artists or writers to write things, because I'm pretty good at writing larger articles, but it's these small 1,200 word, 500 word, 2,000 word articles that 
they're not my forte. That's not the canvas that I work on. And I, no matter how, how hard I try to write a short article, it never ends up short. Right. Um, that's just, that's just me. I'm, you know, as my uh, 11th grade English teacher told me, you're awfully verbose. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, but I use that money to pay those writers. And sometimes I, I hire artists to do conceptual art to a finished level so I can play with something mm. maybe years before it's ever going to see print. Yeah. Um, it's and it's so, a long game. It's a long game. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, so you were working with Don. He wasn't wanting to quite publish your, your stuff for you. Um, and you guys both had, you had, you had red doors that you were working on. He was working on the lesser key, right? Lesser key um, is lesser legion. That's yeah. Lesser. And, and so, and so those things are going on. Can you go ahead and pick up your story from there? Yeah. Um, so he was a, a great resource, right? He was, you know, just somebody who kind of knew some of the lay of the land, knew, uh, you know, where to get stuff published, like just like what, or, you know, printed, not published, mm -hmm. printed, uh, like resources around that. And, and of course, you know, you can, uh, you know, ask in the DCC Rocks um, Facebook page or Discord or whatever, but it's those personal relationships, right? Like a, a, to be able to really drill down and like, and so how does that work and and you know, where <clears throat> yeah. where does it break down and, and where you know you know all the little things that you know you, you feel guilty in a certain sense about like asking a stranger and mm -hmm. so just that pure recommendation kind of level also art right um i think house of the red doors i said was done right like it was complete uh doug kovacs did uh the, that was after the fact i think after the kickstarter but he did a, this kind of you know, a centerpiece, a Loteria board, but all the art was, was, was Stefan Poag. He was still freelancing at that time. He wasn't a staff artist. Um, I even had him do the cover. Right. And so, and I think that was after the fact too, after, after the Kickstarter, because that art is expensive. It is. And, and you think, and you, and, and in essence, you feel guilty about even paying how low you are paying for the art in our space yeah because if you go and talk on twitter and, and and ask anybody about art um you're getting like easily three or four times the the amount uh being charged by by somebody off the street right on twitter a professional artist like a 20 dollar spot you gotta be joking yeah right but that's pretty normal in this space is a 20 dollar spot 30 dollar spot so talking less than a quarter of a page um uh, that's ridiculously cheap. Yeah, it, it really is. And, um, and so, you know, one of the things that I take as a tactic is, is I never, I never try and dictate a price to an artist. I ask them, how much would you charge for X? Uh, yeah. And, and, and then I'll say, I can't afford that. Or yes, I can do that. What would your schedule look like? Yep. Can you fit it to, to when I need it done? Yep. I and, never, I never tell you what my, pro what I want to pay. Cause yeah. it's their, it's their business, you know, that's right. Like what's your quarter page rate? What's your half page rate? What's your full rate? You know, full page. What's color? What's black and white? Um, yeah, and yeah. and they should know, right? That's it's their their business. They should know what they're going to charge for the art they do. That's right. I mean, at the end of the day, they have to feel comfortable that they're doing enough work um, to pay whatever bills they got to pay, um, or or you know, spend the time that they're going to spend out of their life to produce this thing for you. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So anyway, going back to Don, I know we were getting sidetracked, but these are good, like, you know, um, publishers. These are good questions. questions. Yeah. Um, so he kind of pushed me out of the nest, you know, just said, go do it. And so I did the Kickstarter, you know, went, went through the process and, and all that good stuff. Um, for Don's half of, you know, Lesser Key, he had showed to to a few of us that we were, were gaming with and it didn't really stick. The first time they showed it to me, I was like, well, okay, some tables, roll on the table. That's cool. And um, and then later, you know, maybe a month or so later, I looked at it again. I said, well, okay, let's give it a, you know, have a real good look at this and try to figure out what he's trying to do. And and I was like, this is brilliant. You know, there's, there's so much cool stuff in here. And it's just, he's got to finish it. That's all he's got to do. He's got to, mm -hmm. he's just got to finish the damn thing. And, um, and so I'm like, Hey, do you want, do you want to work on this? You know, do you want to let me help you edit it? Basically. I was like, let me help you edit it. And so, so I'm just like, so did you act essentially as a developmental editor, someone who can come in 
throw a couple spot ideas down or something, refine a couple things, say, hey, you know, what if we made this this size table and here's a couple ideas sitting on the side that you can then incorporate? Yeah, was it, was, your it was a function? really big developmental pass. Like I yeah. was like reorganizing tables and p- pulling apart tables and and uh, he, and then contributing, right? Like writing mm-hmm. into it too. Like he's got like five entries left on the table. I'm like, do you want me to write something? He's like, go ahead. Like, yeah, um, it's a real weird thing about tables, especially like a D30 or a D50 table or something, you know, or D, or heaven forbid, a, a D100 table. You know, you put, you can put a lot of thought into it. And man, invariably you get down to like a, a remnant fragment of what you, of what you need to fill out the table. And, um, and then you're like, man, all my brain juice is gone. I, I can't think of another idea of how to do this. There's nothing else for this. There's nothing else for this, right? And so, so you have a couple options. It's great to have a developmental editor or a co-writer who can then come in and sometimes spin off just wonderful ideas and fill up a table and stuff like that. I know I was working with um, Brian Gilkison. We were working on, what were we working on? Oh, the Shoggoth. We were working on the Shoggoth, which is featured in issue three of Tales from the Smoking Worm. And um, and I had done most of the monster creation and I had kind of, we, we modeled it off a dragon. And so I had done these these two different tables of abilities and everything. And Brian was like, well, Shoggoths need their own crit table. And so mm-hmm. on one of those developmental paths is he comes back with a full D30 crit table that he had just sat down and blown out and and I looked at it and it was great, right? It's like, okay, so I went through and I did a little bit of light editing, added a couple ideas where I thought, well, that one's weak and we've got, I've got a better idea. But yeah. but just that contribution just breathes a whole bunch of life into it. And yep. so, yeah, I mean, working with with a co-author, uh, especially on developmenting, developmental editing levels can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, um, you know, we finished it together. Yeah. And at the end of it, you know, I was, I was doing developmental and, you know, editing in essence, it's all his ideas. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the, I think I did something with the reliquary table kind of did it a lot differently than it was. Um, I also pulled in a bunch of reliquary stuff. Cause I love that um, medieval uh, stuff as well. And so I had to kind of re- rewritten the vast majority of that, but you know, he was, uh, I, I'm not sure he would have ever finished it without, yeah without the 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 uh, you know a collaboration on it and he was like you know what james i'm just gonna put you on the cover you're a co-author on this one and so how'd that feel that was a that was awesome that he yeah. would look at all the all the work uh that we essentially did together you know through collaboration and just go you were instrumental in 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 getting this over the line and it's more than editing um you know you've contributed significant pieces and um and 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 i was honored to be part of that work yeah right that's a, it's a great book i love that book it's one of my favorite table books is the the celestial legion one i like it so much i have two of them so I, I several you know, myself. yeah it's you know it is it's it's a wonderful thing if you need an angel or something and you want to just work up something totally random and yeah. and make it sound different um yeah, yeah. I, I certainly have used it as inspiration when I'm working on something like um, uh, issue four of Tales from the Smoking Worm had Jin familiars, and one of the things we were working on is Jin familiars. These little, these little, like they're they're called Dao. These little baby Jin, right? And they have these wild, crazy bodies, right? Physical form. They they could have the head of a little elephant, and they could have you know ears of a duck or something, and you know like totally you know, have the front paws of a lion and the you know the back end of a rabbit. So, you know, you wanted to make something that was, uh, you know, absolutely different. And so you guys had stuff like that to use for inspiration. Go, ah, now I see how I could build a table like this. Right. And, and so those things are really helpful to, to use just as exemplars as a third party publisher. And so I keep it with me when I go to cons and I, and if I get the opportunity to grab a cleric, I do. And then I just start rolling up uh, everything about him. Like, yeah the style of vestments what his holy book looks like all these things i just and then what what is um his uh you know the rites the the kind of prayers and the style of prayer praying and all this other stuff and then i'll role play with that yeah yeah because it's it's fun yeah 
<laughs> and so, you know, with, with since DCC doesn't have an established kind of forgotten realms, this is how X religion worships, right? It's it's all you know every person for themselves, and so something like this is a great tool as a role playing aid for a player who's a cleric. Yeah. And religion's messy anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, like absolutely. In real life, it's not like there is one sect of Christianity. Yeah, no, no. not even like when it was established, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, it's an awesome, and it just dovetails like so perfectly with the Dark Masters kind of like, you know, it's the monster, right? Not monsters. Yeah. And so like this kind of like singularness of, of the unknown, it's the same thing. It's the, the local church that has an identity that's based on the community in which, in which it resides. And you could go... 20 leagues over the mountain and have the same God and the, the, the rights are different. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's normal. I think that's totally uh, reflective of our culture. Yeah. Yeah. Of reality. Of reality. So, so it helps ground that as being a real vibrant living thing. I, so love, that was cool. I love having like a bunch of different sects of just justicica. Right. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Complete. I, I completely agree with you. And then and, you get role playing like between two sects or something like you can totally like there's two clerics of Justica and they hate each other. That'd yeah. Be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I've seen, uh, you know, I've had games where we have, uh, where we have clerics who, who are diametrically opposed in their religion, but they have, they are the same alignment and they worship the same God. And that creates, it shows you, I think it demonstrates how people of similar ideologies can have vitriolic you know, responses to other people who are essentially the same, mm. right? Uh, and over very minute differences, you know? Right. And so, so I think that's, A, it's a good lesson. It's a good life lesson. But B, it's really interesting to role play. Yeah. And, and so, you know, one of the things that, that these products need to have is that ability to inspire people to do those kind of cool things. So you co-wrote this, uh, you know, you were brought on as a kind of developmental editor to help, on get this finished uh, you might have prodded him a bit and uh, and eventually he made you a co-author and there there is a line there <clears throat> you know i mean it's something that i have to i have to fight with every day what's the difference between a developmental editor and what's the difference between a true co-author um yeah. you know and 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 i kind of use a, a something uh, i think you mentioned it a little earlier it's like you get to a point where i could not have accomplished this without your input right right um you know not I, I. There's a recognition that you need a developmental editor on certain projects. We need input. I need outside input, but it could be one of many people who would be helpful. Right. That's a developmental editor to pass. And sometimes I have two different developmental editors, and I move them back and forth between them. Um, you know, but a co-author is somebody who has substantially contributed to something in a way that it is profoundly different right. than what you envisioned because right. of that input. Yeah, yeah. and so. So those are those are messy areas of 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 the life, but it's great that Don, you know, considered you a co-author, put you on the cover, and everything. So so that's that's your relationship with with Don Stroud. Now, he also brought you on for Moldering Dead, right? So yep. apparently, he really liked working with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think whenever we get the chance or whenever it makes sense, we we will work together. Yeah. Right? And so he wanted to do another big project, another a table book and, and undead. And he had lots of stuff. And, and he was just like, you know, same situation. He's got like a table. It's like, you know, part the way finished or it's flat out empty. And he's just like, just put stuff in here. And so, um, and then again, I helped, you know, went ahead and, and edited various, I think I edited the, the main book and one of the adventures and uh in the back and so it was just you know he helps me i help him and mm -hmm. and that's that's just the way it's a great it's a great to have somebody local that you can just kind of um ask for 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 stuff you know hey would you do this thing he was in fact just asking me to write an adventure for like a a, a double double adventure like one of those traveler ones flip books yeah yeah flip books so he's like why don't you write uh, something and then i'll have he has this already this adventure we've already played and i'll just put that in, well I'll, I'll publish that and then we'll publish yours on the back and i was like okay that sounds awesome yeah yeah it's a cool idea yeah so so cool okay so 
So those collaborations can be really useful, but you've also done quite a bit of work on your know, was the, um, the Red Doors, was that your first solo, true solo project? Yeah, all by myself. Uh, you know, like, like, you know, Don kind of pushed me out, out the, out the nest. So you got to do it on your own. Um, I spent a lot of time like writing and kind of trying to get the tone that I wanted out of it. And, and, um, and I think deeply in love with like Tanith Lee and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Death's Master is, is a huge part of, of what House of the Red Doors became. Um, and I think, you know, it's also interesting that her so later books, oh, I can't remember, is it Delirium's Mistress? Maybe the ones after that. Uh, there's this moment where the gods are forced, because uh, the gods are don't do anything in Tanith Lee's um, world. Uh, they just kind of sit and party or, or do do nothing. And then the demons are the ones who are like active in the in, amongst men. And uh, and so the the gods are forced to kind of act because things have gotten out of control. The demons have gotten out of control with mankind. And so, and then they make one of the gods have you know. Uh, they kind of draw straws and one of the gods actually has to do something. Right. And he, and he like creates three angels and he thro throws them down. They're all three different. I was like thinking, like, ah, the celestial legion is so brilliant. You know, it's like it's, dovetails perfectly into that concept. So I think that was one of the things that really got me uh, thinking about Don's book again um, uh, to, 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 to pull it back off the shelf, the manuscript and say, wow, this is awesome. You should finish it. But I think a lot of that was done and it was ready to go. I had the art. I had paid for everything. I had, you know, uh, the Kickstarter. I, I did that Kickstarter. That's, you know, scary. Your first one's scary as all get out because uh, you just don't know what's going to happen um, and, and how it works and, and all that other stuff. There's lots of questions. And Don, again, was there to kind of talk me through you know, kick, a Kickstarter, for instance. Yeah. Um, so that was the first like solo thing. And then it was a solo adventure too, like a duet, like you're you and the judge alone. So it's kind of a different concept. Very different concept from a DCC thing, right? Yeah. And and it can be so now my understanding is is these are not this is not a funnel. This is this can be played at any point in a game. Yeah, it it's still a funnel in. from a zero you should be zero level. It should be zero level. Yeah. Um, but you only get one, or you can have multiple, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you get kind of one, you're by yourself. Yeah. And that, and that is like, um, such an interesting experience as a judge to watch, um, the player have to play it all by themselves. Yeah. Did right? you ever nobody play to collaborate with nobody to like sit back and let them take over for a little while. None of that. It's just yeah. you and what's going on in the story. Before you came to DCC, did you ever play any solo role-playing games where, you know, you had just no. you and another player or you were the player and there was a judge? Nope. I mean, nope. For, uh, like the choose your own path adventure, that's about, that's as far as I got. Yeah. So, so when I was, when I was a teenager, I was, I was growing up, you know, I, I lived in England at the time and uh, we were, we were there in uh, American Air Force Base, Woodbridge. Uh, Bentwater's twin bases uh, this would have been between 86 and 90 yeah 86 and 90 was when I was there and um, and in the later summers I think 89 um, uh, and 88 I had, a, I had a really good buddy uh, Joel Phillips who actually does quite a bit of art for me for Tales from the Smoking Worm and and uh, I used to get up I remember I used to get up at 5 a.m and go into go into my dad went for work he worked at Woodbridge and then I would ride the the they had a, these were two Air Force bases that were only like three miles apart. And so they had a little bus that would run back and forth. So I'd ride the bus back and forth. My dad would take me down to the bus when it started at like six in the morning. And then I would ride the bus back and forth like four times till I could get to about eight o'clock in the morning. So I had nothing to do. And, and then I would walk off the base off of Bentwaters and walk about two miles down to my friend's house and wake him up at, at about nine. He refused to get up before nine. <laughs> and, uh, and so you know, and so so that was what my summers were like, quite a bit of them. And I, you know, I would just wake him up. And it got to the point where his parents would leave the door unlocked so I could come in. And instead of pounding on the door and waking people up, they would just let me, you know, I would just come in and, and wait for him to wake up. And then we would game all day. Nice. And it, But it was just the two of us. And so, yeah. um, so those are, those are very different role-playing game sessions than, uh, 
than a group, right? I mean, it really is different. And so, yeah, and 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 anybody who um, hasn't done it should try it. You know, yeah, yeah. it's a great experience. I mean, it just is really. I wish um, I had an adventure like that that I could play, be the player in. Yeah, like that. Um, yeah, because it is. It, it's just you're like, you know, you're watching someone problem solve. Yeah. On both sides, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So you ran the Kickstarter. It was successful. Um, you um, you got your your uh, your book printed, and then at Gen Con, that would have been 2019. You yeah. ran it as a tournament, right? Yes. That's right. Yes. And you even had a tournamental. You you had you had like first and second place. You had a little red door. I had a statue. I had a trophy. I made yeah. a trophy. Made a trophy. Made it myself. Yeah. <laughs> collecting various bits and pieces and trying to figure out how it's all going to work. And um, I think the only thing I started with was like the decal, the DCC uh, RPG. Is it like a face? Uh, was it a face tattoo it's thing or whatever? Skull face, right? Which was yeah. the original first black cover, you know, black leatherette um, gold uh, foil cover right. had this, has this skull that, that shows up again and again. I mean, I mean, obviously the dark master likes that image because he's used yeah. it several times, but brilliant. It's yeah, like a right. face tattoo. That's all I have. And then <laughs> yeah. Build this thing and decide I'm going to run a tournament, which is an, an absolute insanity uh, of a, a concept. Basically, you know, whatever. It was a lot of fun to run it. And, um, you know, if you haven't run one before, you really should. It's yeah. a great way to, um, you know, interact with the community. Absolutely. And so, you know, from there, um, you've moved on to do other products. So House of Red Doors is first. It's a first solo product. And then you, you know, kind of were quiet for a while. And then you popped up with three or four products. You had you had the Computarx hardback, if I remember correctly, right? Yep. First. And then um, and then and everything. And so so what is what do those do and and what was that about? Yeah. So I think I think a lot of why I write is you see it's not a whole right? There's not a hole in the game. Like, you could play that core book, right, as is, and the adventures and stuff, and it's an absolutely fantastic experience. Um, but MCC came out too, right? And, and and maybe there are a few holes in that particular um, book. And one of them in particular was around spells, or, you know, pro programs, yeah. um, otherwise known as spells. Um and so, you know, the author, you know, Jim uh, Wampler is like, well, you you can totally use the the, the spells as as programs, um, and I guess that's fine. Um, for me, it lacks it. There's a there's like a flavor thing that goes missing at that point. You're like, you're running a program, quote unquote. It's a spell. Um, it's couched in a really different way uh you know totally that fantasy vibe and and then and then but you're running a program and I'm a computer professional and so that for me that's a big um you know it's a big disconnect it's it's a buzz kill to like sure. to, to like talk about programming and what we're really doing is talking about um fantasy spells it it, it it's a, it it doesn't jive and so it became a passion project, basically. As soon as MCC kind of landed, I was like, it started, right? Like almost right in that instant that I had the book in my hands, I'm like, uh, I gotta, I gotta get going. I gotta write all this stuff. And, and I contacted Joseph, told him what I'm doing. I was like, I'm gonna be using your content and kind of window dressing it, but it's it's really your stuff like your words, your, your structure, you know, the structures, that kind of stuff. I, middle, I, you know, you, as you go along, you kind of have to play with little bits and pieces here and there to get it to, to work right. But some of the, some of the spells are in, in, in the programs are, are, you know, really close to one another syntactically. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm, I'm just taking your stuff and I'm going to redo it. And he's like, go ahead, you know, have fun. Um, and, and so, and it started right at that minute, and and it, and it took a few years really to get finished. And it was going to be a bigger book, and the pandemic happened too. And so then you're starting to like 
freak out about well what does are people going to be able to buy stuff like <laughs> really basic level economic stuff like nobody has a job how are we going to do anything like you know yep I, i'm totally insulated i'm in you know it i've been doing remote teams for for forever and but not everybody else has and so right. are people even going to have the money to like buy <clears throat> Yeah. So the the project was going to be huge in scope. It was going to be patron AIs. It was going to be uh, spells. It was going to be new spell, you know, new programs. It was going to be new, um, you know, just bunches and bunches. Anything I could think of, really, that I, that was computer stuff. I just jam it all together, two hundred page book, something like that. And and then I just was like, I can't. There's no way, right? I can't even conceive of taking that leap economically. Sure. And um, so I winnowed it down and said, okay, well, we're just going to focus on uh, the core core spells and kind of translate them over, bring in some new, you know, there's a handful of new ones in there, completely new concepts in, in, in Kyridian. Um, and then, but that left me a lot of leftover content too. Yeah. Like all the patron AIs sitting around. So it was really easy, like after getting that first book out and seeing also seeing like there's it's not the end of the world um it's not an apocalypse uh not quite kind of it's mildly not apocalyptic yep. and so uh all this extra content's lying around and it was really easy just to kind of um shoehorn you know let's do also this extra series of stuff yeah and at the same time don came back and was like hey i, I got some loose articles around post-apocalyptic stuff. Do you want to put together a zine quest Kickstarter? I'm like, oh God, no, I don't want to do <laughs> I've done like two or three. And I was just like, this is a drag uh, doing Kickstarters. Um, it's the waiting. It's like the, the you know, setting everything up and, and kicking it off and just waiting and like the doldrums in the middle and all this stuff. And like thinking like, uh, it should be doing better or who even cares like you're just trying to if, if it funds that's it you know hooray and dcc community is awesome everything funds I, I can't think of very many projects that haven't especially now no not anymore no i mean the people come out and they support the third party publishers which is uh unbelievable i mean yeah second to none this community you, you know i mean i think you're right but that doesn't change the anxiety that happens halfway through that Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And it can be, I, I don't know, uh, you know, really visceral sometimes. I mean, there are, there are times when I'm watching a Kickstarter, my Kickstarter running, and it hasn't really done much for two or three or four days sometimes. And you're like, yeah. oh my God, the world is falling apart, right? I, you know, right. because while you're running that Kickstarter, you're sitting there thinking about it and what this is, this is what it's going to fund. This is how I'm going to get all this done. There's, a ton of planning and a ton of thinking go, goes into it. And I don't know about you. I mean, I have had to force myself to not check Kickstarters when <laughs> I, once I get past like the first two or three days, there's a point in time where I'm like, I, I can check it in the morning. I will let myself check at midday and I will let myself check it in the evening. But I mean, I will try my very best to stay off social media, to stay off the internet and do something completely different. Because otherwise, yeah. you find yourself just staring at this thing, you know, willing it to go refresh. forward. You know, refresh, 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 and it is, oh, it's it's it is maddening. And so, yeah, it can be very very difficult. I agree. Yeah. So he 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 tricked me into another one with, <laughs> with the three zines for Zine Quest three or whatever it was. Yep. And he published the twenty five ghosts, and then we published that book together. The post of the unveiled elisions. Um, because I was playing around with with that concept of a pure strain human. Another time where you're thinking, this is what drives me. It's like this doesn't quite work for me. Um, I'm sure there's other people out there that are feel the same way, and that like just spurs you on to writing this stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, I I kind of I support 95 to 98 percent of the DCC MCC Kickstarters that exist and have for five, six years now. <clears throat> and I kind of see what the products that third-party people are putting out, publishers are putting out as a conversation about where people see, not deficiencies, but where they see 
um, where they feel they could do work and contribute. And, and it's interesting to see that and feel it. I mean, there's a, obviously there's a huge section of that that is adventures, right? You know, there are only so many published adventures. You can only go through them so many times. And so there is a real need for more adventures. But there's also a need for, like you said, patron AI spells, patron AIs, you know, yeah. rebuilt classes and things like this. And Supplements. Uh, yeah. Supplemental material. And 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 so <clears throat> that's why when when I when we hit on the idea of Tales from the Smoking Worm, it was very much meant to fill a gap that like a dragon magazine fills, where it's just you have a you have a peppering of different ideas every issue and and everything because that allows me to jump around and I don't have to be the consistency is the format. It's not what I'm talking about inside the articles. Yeah. But yeah, but absolutely. So so yeah, so I mean it's interesting to hear that, you know, you kind of feel like you're you're finding things you're like, oh, this uh, this could be different, or there could be a good table for this, or there could be, you know, a way to handle this, and so so that has led you down a path where you're you're working intensely on uh, computer based stuff um, and everything, and and a couple other things that have that have come about since then. Uh, you've recently started your own Patreon, right? Yeah. And so, what was that experience? What led you? to build a Patreon, um, what do you do in your Patreon? And 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 do you feel that it's fulfilling uh, the goal that you expect it to? So the Patreon, I think, I think goes back to the feelings about Kickstarter mm -hmm. um, and how, um, and it also has some of the same feelings that Kickstarter will, will make, you know, make you kind of insecure and panicky. Because uh, you're like saying, "Hey, come to this web page and pay me money every month, and I will give you, you know, I will write something for you." Yeah. Uh, and and so, and I had tried it at one point, uh, like a few years before, and, and just kind of like, I can't, I can't do this. And and so this this one is about a different kind of project and an outgrowth really of the Computark um, series, which is all programming, right? But like what what can we do inside the computer or like like a tron kind of thing mm -hmm. but also like cyberpunk right and how there's always these this tension cyberpunk like the style of those books are fantastic right there's like these chapters and you can go back and forth through storylines and it's 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 a great ride to read that book um and that change up between cyberspace and the meat space uh you know, you know, lets you, let, you're hanging on what happened in the meat space or you're hanging on what happened in the cyberspace, depending on kind of where you are or where, where the story's going. Um, but that's not so great at a table, sure. <laughs> like playing uh, an RPG. <coughs> Invariably, it kind of gets down to like the hacker's doing something and the rest of the party's doing something else or they're guarding the hacker while the hacker does the stuff or whatever. I think the most recent copy of cyberpunk got better at that um but that's always been this kind of this real tension between these two really distinct experiences uh that don't uh jive really well together and so yeah especially when there are time lags between them i mean right. so so you look at cyberpunk you look at like say shadowrun early versions of shadowrun where you could have a i think it was very prominent in early versions of cyberpunk too where there were multiple rounds like i mean you could have huge events and, and multiple rounds of things happening in cyberpunk before you got through six seconds or 10 seconds or whatever it was right. in the meat space. Right. Yep. And so and what even, a hacker could do, you know, when they were jacked in was, uh, you know, I remember there was a point in time where <clears throat> I supported, I, I, I got a, I got a copy of um, the cyberpunk fanzine interface. Uh, I have all six issues of that from the nineties. And I, if I recall right, I mean, there was a there was an article in there that was saying, you know, you really just need to run your cyberpunk, you know, networking stuff ahead of time and basically hand the player like an envelope with the answer. And then he can go through and he or she can go through and do that. And then you guys defend him and everything. And you say, OK, now you're jacked in. All that happens. You succeed or you die. Right. And you and then you hand them that the, this is what your goal was. Huh. Um, you know, and so, but yeah, there's this huge disconnect. And so what seems like a really cool thing is hard. It's really and, hard. 
really hard. And so, to, and it's really hard to run. I mean, I don't know yeah. about you, but as a, as, as a judge, you're running in two different places at the same time. And so you have to balance that um, yeah. and move yeah. back and forth as fast as you can. So you don't have like four players sitting and doing nothing for three hours while you work with one person. Right. Or, or the, or vice versa. Right. Um, right. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a, it is a complex thing. So, so you're trying to tackle that. Yeah. And so um, you think about a computer processor, right? Thousands, you know, millions of operations per second. Yeah. Discrete mathematical, you know, operations happening per second. And uh, electrons at the speed of light, running at the speed of light through circuits, integrated circuits. And so what's the big deal if everybody goes in all together? Yeah. Like they all jack in together and they explore, they solve the computer related problem, whatever it is, whatever the MacGuffin is, in all together as a group, like a, like they're adventuring in a, in a cyber dungeon. And, and so, um, and so, yeah, I have a copy of hack right here. And I have, I have a copy because I bugged you to death to give me one at Gen Con. You did indeed. Um, so um, I was happy to give it to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, just kind of really quick that it kind of, there's like, I think there's five or six classes, something like that. Uh, very DCC kind of style, right? There's the, the, the war driver who's your warrior and, and the hacker who's the thief. Uh, but he also is kind of getting closer to like the the um, magician in Dying Earth. So some a few like preloaded uh, script level stuff that they can deploy. Um, and like a native, a computer native, kind of taking the Tron, the second movie of Tron, where they, they find the isomorphs or whatever. Uh, and so like, hey, there's a class that's basically they, they came from the machine. They're, they, mm -hmm. they're native to the environment. Um, it's kind of like a halfling and basically kind of that halfling vibe um, and a hologram kind of person and, and just a straight up wizard, uh, you know, a cybernaut and then equipment and, and, and kind of, uh, so it's like, you know, there's like five or six sections. It's like a complete game, I guess. I mean, there's a bestiary, there's a way to make an adventure by rolling dice and pushing it all together, uh, kind of like a hex crawl. And um, some really basic stuff about for combat, uh, mainly for the to support the war driver, that warrior class. So they have mighty deeds that they can mm -hmm. roll on, and and that's it. And so that's what's happening in that Patreon is I'm writing and developing and and then um, uh, talking about the choices I'm making, where the influences come from, where what what kind of mechanics I'm, I'm deploying, you know, employing and, and all these other kinds of things. So, and, and when uh, Harley ran a little cyberpunk thing uh, during the, the last um, Cyclops con, and I got to sit in on that. And, uh, and so a few things, you know, kind of like some synergy or some uh, conversation with what he was doing too, in his uh, little like cyberpunk adventure, which was a lot of fun to play. And so I'll talk about that that particular experience of playing in Harley's game in this Patreon. And so far, like the, basically we're up to this point, everything that's in this book is in the Patreon. Um, and also I think, and this is kind of going, you know, you feel so guilty running a pat Patreon and you're like, give me some money because I'm writing things and you, please, you know, it just feels embarrassing uh, in, in a certain sense. Um, I'm, and so I think it's really, Personally, just me personally, I think I should produce physical content. Mm -hmm. It may not be like high quality content. Like this is just, you know, the copy shop, right? Going down and doing it kind of old school and um, and printing it out and stapling it together. Um, it's not like sending it off to your, 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 your favorite printer and getting a nice slick uh, adventure. But I think it's really important to give physical stuff. You've given me money and yes, I can give you virtual things, but I think it's really important you know, a, a Patreon should be like, and also here is this. Thank you for sticking around for the past three months or however long it is. And so yeah. I'm going to keep keep doing that and making sure that whoever's I got, and I don't have very many people, very many subscribers, seven seven people. Um, hey, why don't you join my Patreon? Um, I'll I'll send you one of these. Uh, 
uh, but um, it's been it's a really great place to be meditative about what you're writing and to kind of also explain yourself. And then what naturally kind of happens is you're like talking about this thing and and then you go, ah, I can develop that into gameable content too. Right. So how much interaction do your patri uh, do your your patrons have with you in this in this quest? Are they just consumers? They're reading and it's really giving you um, an outlet to explore, but it's largely like reading a novel from their point of view. Or do they get to interact with you and ask questions and suggest give suggestions and stuff? Well, the platform like kind of allows them to comment sure. on on whatever you're you're writing, and and sometimes they do, and sometimes you can ask them specifically, kind of call to them and say, well, what do you think? Or you can even like um, I think the most the, the way I have the conversation the most is sending them messages, like direct messages, not not writing on a post or writing in comments. It's like um, Hey, do you want to play this sometime? I'm I'm play play testing this thing. Do you want to play it, right? Or um, or I hope you know I hope you're liking what you're seeing or or whatever. Like soliciting them for for like their feedback, but in a really private way. It's just me and them via the the messaging platform, in <clears throat> right? Uh, Patreon. So um, a lot of people I know, like they're all like either DCC people or people I know for work or 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 whatever. For the most part, it's all DCC community. Uh, and people who I know physically, I've, I've met them physically. Um, uh, so I like it because it gives you kind of this place to to, to develop in pieces, mm -hmm. you know, kind of serialized content to go along to a goal. And I also didn't want to like say, let's, I want to Kickstarter this thing. I don't even know if this is the thing I want to write or finish, right? It's like, it's an ash can, like in the terminology, right? It's like... Yeah a complete game but for the purposes of evaluation it's not really the product it's it's something to uh, have a conversation with with another developer or another gamer yeah and this and and the purpose of that patreon then and their and patronage is it's just a little incentive to help you get through it and it, and it's that it's that echo chamber voice yeah. conversation you know these are people who I mean, hopefully believe in the cause and uh, and and are willing to contribute at some level uh, to the conversation that you want to have yeah. as you're moving through it. Yeah. 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 I, 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 um, I don't have a Patreon. I've considered it several times, but um, I do have a, a secret Facebook page that we used to use more heavily for smoking worm in the early days when those Kickstarters ran, there was a, uh, a pledge level where you could get in, you know, I would, I would let you into the secret Facebook page for, you know, three to five months, kind of depending on it. it was basically set up saying you'll get to see everything we develop as we're having these conversations about the current issue. And then you'll get to see the upcoming issue because they overlap yeah. and everything. And, and that was really useful. Um, I met artists that way, people who signed up because they were interested, but it turns out they're artists. Yeah. Um, you know, those people give feedback. I, I sometimes I poll them, you know, and, and stuff. And, it's, you know, I fulfilled that obligation to everybody a couple issues back and I've never, we actually took that off of the Kickstarters because frankly, I was getting too many reward levels. And so it was becoming confusing for people to see what they were, yeah, right? So I've tried to simplify my Kickstarters now and stuff, but, but I can definitely- existence is having to go to the Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, but it is, it is fundamentally an important funding source for for these projects you you know you don't get the level of support you would get off of patreon you don't get that same level of support if you went to an indiegogo you don't get the level of support if you went to just stay straight to dcc rocks the facebook page and there you know there's five thousand people on that and said i have a product you should buy it yep. you're not going to get that level of support than you do in a, in a kickstarter nope. um, you're definitely not going to get that level of support if you find a way to fund it all yourself and then just post it on the Goodman Games website, right? right. You'll never sell <laughs> what you need to try and recoup those basic expenses. You are absolutely right. Barring, it's, it's, a, it's barring, a great way to get a pile of money all at once. Yeah. And people will do it. And that's, that's the allure of it all. Mm -hmm. So, so that, how do you, um, so you see the Patreon is fitting into your project your overall project goals 
as it is a thing that allows you to actively think and and actively pursue trying to figure out what it is this project should be. Yeah. yeah. Keeps you on a schedule, right? Because you're like every month you have to produce the content at the at the tiers that you're you you say you're gonna produce. Mm -hmm. And so um it's it's really a great way to regiment your your writing. Sure. Yeah. I can see that as a as a useful tool. Um so you've got a Patreon, you've got all this computer basic stuff and everything and and uh, and everything. And you've talked a lot about your project inspirations. So um but you also have an upcoming Kickstarter speaking of Kickstarter, speaking the cats of, of Ratlu, right? Yes. And cats so of Ratlu. Cats of Rotlu. So what can you tell us about the Cats of Rotlu? So Cats of Rotlu is a, a collaboration with my daughter. Really? Yes. Um, uh, so she, I, you know, I'm a goofball at the home and uh, I'm always talking about some dumb thing and kind of like, you know, hassling the kids. And, and so one of the things I always, well, not always, but um, I love Husker Du. And so there's this song on the end of New Day Rising called uh, How to Skin a Cat. And it's just kind of like this weird, you know, drums and like, you know, kind of some noise, some guitar noise, a little up scale kind of thing. And it's like this guy having a conversation about a, a cat skin ranch where you, you know, you get, you sell these cat skins for, for money by, and, and, the, and the way you make this circle work is you, you feed uh, the, the, the cats after their skin to the rats and the rats to the cats. And so you get the cat skins for nothing. And so it's, you know, feels very much like uh, the, the underpants gnome kind of method of business, you know, like steel underpants, question mark, profit. So like these two like business concepts, uh, I don't know, are just dumb and funny to me. And so I'm going to kind of, you know, the, I'll, I'll talk to the kids about it and I'll sing this, you know, I'll recite this song, this, this, this song. And she's like, Dad, you should do a book about, you should do an adventure about this. I was like, what? Why? She's like, I don't know. You're always talking about it. And, and so, so this idea of like cats and the cat ranch and all this other stuff, it's like, well, how do you get from point A to point B? And, and so, of course, uh, it has to be a little ghoulish. And the best uh, place uh, to for your ghouling is, um, you know, some HP Lovecraft. So Absolutely. Just, so we love cats. Whole, whole hog cats of ulther right like we're talking about cats cats of cats of ulther um and all this other stuff. so it all kind of starts coming together and so it's lots of clark ashton smith and lots of hp lovecraft you know um kind of even lots of nods to those stories and uh even names of characters and all this other stuff and so um it's an investigative st uh, sandbox uh I, I kind of did like a live, um, the, the middle section is, is a, he a hex crawl that's generated on the fly. Like, okay. so like the kind of the, the act two of the adventure, really the climax where, where you have to find uh, the, bad, the bad guy is this hex crawl. So you're just rolling hexes as they kind of progress and things happen. Um, and, and so that was kind of a cool uh, mechanic. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly, it, it felt too, there's basically a catacomb. Mm -hmm. and, and so you could like map all that out and, and have everything discreetly labeled, but I didn't really, it just didn't get my, didn't get me going like as a concept, right? It's like, sure. well, what if we just made this really loose and at the table and you're just kind of like rolling and then the map develops over time and it's different every time. And, and so that's kind of, just this little bolt that kind of came in the middle of the adventure writing, right? As a catacomb should be, right? Right. 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 They should be nearly endless, randomly complex. Yes. And 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 different every time you go down. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so <laughs> and that's the that's the adventure. So a little it's just a short little thing. It's not it's not that long. It's about um uh 15, 20 pages, something like that. Well, cool. Cool. Is it a is it a funnel or is, do you have a level that you're targeting it for? It's first level. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's, 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 a, it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I've played it a few times. I've had uh, judges play test it too. And everybody's kind of come back and said they really enjoyed it. I think 
uh, I think it's really great in a four hour slot too. You can let the players kind of screw around for three hours and then there's just this way to just kind of like go, okay, and now it's time to wrap this thing up last hour. Here's, here's the start. Um, they could have gotten there before, depending on how they, you know, how they play through uh, the sandbox. Uh, but you you have this valve, this safety valve of just being able to go, okay, and now it's time, right? Yeah. Everything, it's going to hit the fan now. Um, so we can wrap it up in the next hour. Very cool. Yeah, sounds like a fun project. Yeah. Um, I really like, and this is something that I, I actually honestly think that <clears throat> I've noticed the Kickstarter adventures across the third-party spectrum get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're up to, some of them are up to 64 pages now. And that's a lot of material. God bless them. Uh, yeah, yeah. God bless them. Uh, but it's also a lot of material to run through. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm a, I always, hopefully I don't take too long with an adventure, but I mean, I always, I always let, I always let adventures breathe and take on their own life. If I'm running something that's pre-planned, uh, I give it room to feel unique and everything. Yeah. And I can, you know, I mean, you know, I can take months to go through a, a publish adventure. I'm not, I'm yeah. not in a hurry. I'm there to have fun and I'm there to relax and hang out with my friends. And so yeah. it's not like I'm not at a con scene every time I play with my buddies. And so, um, so yeah, so these, you know, I mean, I played, uh, I ran against the giants and it took us six months and, yeah. and they only got through half of it. Right. right? They burnt down the stronghold, uh, the, <laughs> the giants uh, stronghold before they move forward. Never got to level two, <laughs> or the, the the catacombs below it and everything. Right. Else. And so, so I always, you know, I'm of, of the mind that that shorter things that allow for a lot of flexibility are really a niche in not just the DCC community, but any any good role playing community um, that are desperately in need. Right. Right. Yeah. You know. Everybody's got different kind of windows that they can work with, and yeah, and. Um... Get, you know, it's great if you can play Temple of the Elemental Evil all the way through. That would be most wonderful, of, wouldn't it? Most of us don't have that kind of time. No, no, um, not, not since high school. Not <laughs> since high school. And so having it, and I don't want to, I don't mean this in, in a negative, but kind of as a party game, right? Like something that is, allows you to role play, but ha can be, you know, can all of a sudden, it has something that's inflective and, and, and allows the party to, to get on the track to, to get to the end, you know, and, and you can kind of yeah. plan for that. Right. And, and adventures that can do that, I think are, you know, they serve their purpose. And I don't know how I, you know, made these decisions, but they just kind of, they, they come out that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're getting to the end here. Uh, we're, uh, we've gotten kind of about 10 minutes left if we, if we want to use it. Um, but um and Vitani Maru says uh, that they love one shots because they make for great party games, right? And that's that's true too. Right. And and I like things that have that flexibility, that can be extended and explored and made deeper on a personal level with a group in a unique way, but also have the cap the flexibility to be able to run in four hours, and um, and just allow the judge to really get the beats down and yeah. still be viable and important. I, I, so, so I think, I think both of those are, are different play styles and they're both legitimate and a product that can serve both is special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've got, you, we, we've got, you got a lot of depth here. You know, you've got these, uh, alliances with Don Stroud, you've got, you know, the house of red doors, you've got the computark computer hacking stuff, and then, and you've got hackers and, uh, and then, and then we also have, you know, something like the, the, the cats of Ratlu. Um, and so you have, you have a lot of stuff here. What do you find inspires you to write? What is your development process like? Yeah. Um, I think the most, the key to really all of it is reading, right? Like I spend a, a fair amount of my, uh, you know, yearly allotted time of reading books and and they they form the basis of you know little snippets of inspiration like you're you know you're not trying to rip off you know hp lovecraft or, or Clash, uh, clark ashton smith but what you want is kind of like the feelings you get from them right yeah 
And, and so the reading of those, that <clears throat> material is the thing that helps um, give the inspiration to kind of, you know, guide you, you know, push through the difficult moments really, you know, is, is kind of forming that, the DNA of, of the thing you're writing. So the reading is, is critical, right? And I think it is no stretch of the imagination to, to say that, you know, this, this community, you know, worship, you know, worships at the feet of, of Appendix N, right? It's, it's in the DNA of this game. And so that, that reading and that kind of, that's, that's how I kind of get going. So like when I was writing in, in, in Kyridian, it was tons of, of, of William Gibson and, and uh, John Walter Williams and, and all the guys, right? All the cyberpunk guys and also sci-fi, like just reading tons of stuff like Dan, uh, Sims, uh, uh, oh Lord, um, Endemon series and, mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things. So, so all these really great books, right. Become inspirations into, into what, what gets written. Yeah. And, and, and so that's, I mean, that's not a unique position to be in. Right. Um, I've read a lot of you know, one of the things that I like about reading books, uh, especially fantasy and science fiction or we weird tales, um, is that authors often get a little bit of time to put an afterword in. Um, certain authors were really good for many years, especially in the 80s and 90s, about putting in afterwards that kind of tell a little story about how they wrote this and things that happened to them and stuff. Um, you know, Piers Anthony was really famous for having these long I mean, almost like narrative with a narrative, continuous stories about his life in the afterwards. Orson Scott Card has done this in the past and other authors too. Um, you know, so those those little behind the scenes snippets and what those authors tell us often is that their day is broken up into writing, but there is a huge proportion of time put to reading. Yeah. You know, um, and, and it's, you know, full of ideas. And I, I totally, totally would have to agree with that. You know, I'm writing, I'm working on a, I'm working on a product right now that is about ships and airships and oceanic ships and naval ships and things like this and spaceships. It kind of runs the gamut and tries to connect all that thing through with the central DNA of, of the ship. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been reading a lot of big, you know, uh, Napoleonic, um, you know, naval combat books and mm. things like this and mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Because those people, often these historical fiction authors have really spent a lot of time reading about, you know, naval combat and how ships function. And there's just, just, you know, just reading it. And not only is it interesting, because yeah. uh, it's really talking about a, a fast, uh, like a type of life that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But, um, but the, the emphasis and the discussion about things about, Oh, this is how cannons strike wooden vessels. And this is, you know, really yeah. it's it's the splinters that kill people, right? And they show up and they've got like 18 inch or 20 inch splinters through their through their shoulders and everything yeah. and stuff. You know, those are things that you you really have to think about, you know, and, and it's almost as close as you can get to experiencing it. Right. And so, so a joke about writers, right? And I think this is really important for anybody who's doing this as a writer. Um real and true. Yeah, uh, not not game, writing games, right? Um, you're a writer, and and so there's always this joke about you know writing and like my internet search history is is really dodgy, right? Because I'm writing a murder mystery or whatever it is, yeah. And because you're really trying to, you are um, getting the truth of of the thing that you're you're writing about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because those little factoids that are important ground that, no matter how fantastic it is. Yeah. Right. The ability and and I, like just I mean, that's the thing that kind of tripped you up when you first looked at MCC. It was like, oh, these factoids are not as I would expect them to be right. being an expert at X. Right. Yeah. Um, and the same thing is true. Uh, you know, you know, I taught forensic science for 20 years and and, you know, it, it's the same oh, and biology. And so th those are the things that trip me up. Right. I can't watch. I literally cannot watch. A police procedural anymore they just they hurt they 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 wound me to the soul right yeah um, and you're just like no there's so many things here that are wrong this is just not what the world is like and um and so yeah so so those are those are important you should listen to those because yeah. when you're when you're i think as a 
as a writer, and I think you're right, um, you know, you know, those are the things that are telling you this is where you need to write. Yeah. Right. This is what you need to write about. Yeah. 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 It, it's so, you know it, right? And so yeah. you want to share that. Yeah. 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 You want to share that truth, that 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 fact. Absolutely. Well, James, we're we're basically at the end here. I I really appreciate you coming on and. Uh, we've done, uh, uh, I think, a, had a really good conversation about kind of process and history and how products, you know, projects move one to the other and partnerships and, and developmental writing, uh, editing, which is something we haven't talked about yet on the show. I actually, we have an interview um, coming up with, uh, with, with somebody who edits professionally at multiple levels. And so this is something that, that Scrivener is hoping to, to do more of. But, um, you know, hearing firsthand from a fellow third party publisher, their experience as a developer and then becoming a co-author and everything is is really I think it's really fascinating and really helpful. Is there anything, any last things you'd like to talk about or or advice you'd like to give the third party publishing community? You know, people who are just getting started or about to get started or maybe getting inspired to get started. Um. I think the one thing I would I would say is uh, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask people to collaborate. I know it's ex extremely frightening. Um, uh, and, and, and I get it. But I think there's real power in in asking it, it's a, it's you're doing honor to the person really that you're asking like you, you know, you don't you want to learn something you really want to and, and you that person you perceive uh, knows knows something that could help you and 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 all along right all these moments like we've kind of gone through is like there's this these points where the, the collaboration is the key like the the actual conversation with another human being yeah. and asking them to do yeah you know, I want to write a book for you you don't know me from Adam uh, right uh, you know Don, uh, you know, here's this thing. It's like, hey, you need to finish this. We need to yeah. work on this together. We, we, it needs to get done. Um, so reach out to wh whoever, right? Anybody, and and just ask. You know, I want to do this. I want to do this with you. I want to ask you questions about this. Um, I, I think that is the, the the key to to moving forward. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and the only thing I could add to that is, is don't be crushed if that person doesn't have time to do that. Right. Find somebody else. Right. Yeah. It, it, it has nothing to do with you probably. Right. Yeah, probably too busy right now um, or whatever. Or maybe so, they're an asshole. Maybe uh, they're an asshole. But <laughs> keep wait, asking. Wait. Sorry. Oops. Lana, we apologize. We didn't even mention we're close. It's after nine o'clock, isn't it? I think that's yep, legit. Yep, yep. We're, it's legal. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much, James. I really appreciate it. One of the things that we didn't get to talk to because of the length of the show tonight is we didn't even get to talk about your gesh across the multiverse. Um, it's something that the Scrivenery has, uh, has plugged. Ed Stanek, when he was a co-host, has plugged it several times. We've talked about it on the show probably every session for the last six or seven shows. Wow. Uh, Nick Barron has talked about it too. And so I would love to maybe get you back, um, you know, um, in a couple of months to talk just about the Gesh across the multiverse and where you're thinking about going with it and everything. And That'd for those who don't remember, that is a multi third party publisher effort to create kind of a living campaign that highlights third party publishing game worlds in a way that's really, um, you know, non frightening and friendly and brings people into the community so they can see and you can highlight your work for them. Yeah, these so, great tastes of, of all this stuff that's the rich tapestry of DCC community. Yeah, it's 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 it, it I, I think I think that's a good metaphor. It it is a taste of DCC third party publishing, right? It's like when you go to those festivals and it's like the taste of Cincinnati or something. This yeah. is the taste of DCC. Yeah. So um yeah, so we'll hopefully get you back and, and talk about that. I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. And everybody else, uh, this is uh, Trevor Stamper, and uh, this has been another episode of The Scrivenery, and we've been interviewing and talking to James Posano. You all have a great night. Cheers. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.